It's uh, great to uh, see all of you made it. Um, we have a terrific uh, set of uh, distinguished speakers for this panel, which is the uh, second plenary panel. And um, we have a continuing theme, as we were exhorted in uh, this morning's talks, a theme of action. And uh, as some of the written remarks talked about, about actions that are appropriate, that are beneficial and most impactful. Um, I'm Pat Falcone. Um, I have, uh, as well as the very great pleasure of working in President Obama's White House um, with colleagues like Valerie Jarrett, whom we all had the pleasure of listening to this morning. Um, I sit on the White House Council on Women and Girls that she chairs on behalf of the President. And I also work at the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Um, I might say that one of the pleasures at the um, Office of Science and Technology Policy is that I co-chair one of the committees of something called in the U.S. the National Science and Technology Council, which was mentioned this morning, but is an opportunity to work on issues that cross agencies and departments. And um, so many of these issues are worked in some of those committees, and that is an opportunity for agency programs and best practices to be spread uh, to other departments and agencies. So that's at least a place someone asks about um, cross-fertilization, and that's one place. I also want to say that one of the great privileges is uh, shining a light on a lot of the great actions uh, that go on um, in the area of gender issues, in particular related to women and science, technology, and engineering and mathematics. And of course, uh, one of the institutions that I've had a pleasure of working with lots more since I have been uh, at OSTP is getting to know much more about the work of the National Science Foundation and its folks like Cora Merritt and Wanda Ward. And, um, and it's uh, Director Designate France Cordova, whom we're excited to have come join the team as well. So um, as a part of that continuing pleasure, um, what we're going to try to do today is focus on, as I said, focusing on action, but in particular action um, related, again, to themes we heard a lot about today, related to innovation. I have to be careful, clearly, not to move my head. I'm sorry. Um, although I'd like to see all of you. It's really an aspect-challenged uh, room <laughs> in some ways. Um, so our focus uh, in this panel is, again, on innovation. How do we promote innovation? How do we harness innovation for the benefit of all people? And also about partnerships, because, of course, to make impact on the very great human problems facing us, on the very great challenges uh, that we aspire to solving, uh, partnerships, bringing people together um, is a key part of that. Now, our focus in this panel relative to innovation and partnerships are about innovation and partnerships with two kinds of institutions, uh, institutions of higher education and our learned societies and our various nations. Um, we want to focus on mechanisms and strategies to work with these institutions. And, um, and maybe also, as Julia talked about um, earlier, to form even though we have these very formal institutions to form new societies of knowledge. It seems like that um, as we think about our um, task today in this panel in particular, but our task for the next three days as a part of this gender summit, uh, I thought, and as we have our speakers that are going to speak to various aspects of how do we think about innovation, how do we think about partnerships, specifically with institutions of higher education and with our learned societies, that it might be useful to just uh, step back and review what the missions of institutions of higher education and of our learned societies are so that we have kind of a framework in our head to hang the different strategies that our speakers will bring and um, as as we try to distill um, this learning, link it to the learning from the previous discussion and the many ones yet to come on crafting these meaningful, beneficial, and most impactful actions. So the key roles um, 
that these institutions have. Um, and all of these, of course, have very strong international dimensions. And I think we can uh, find uh, topics of interest um, that have already been highlighted, but we have to hone in our thinking about them to get to actions are, first of all, of course, the role of institutions of higher education primarily around education and training. And when we think about gender issues relative to the mission, the educational mission of education and training, these topics of access and participation, about teaching approaches, teaching approaches that are sensitive to cognitive knowledge that we're learning, to the quality, to the culture of teaching, and then also the issue of mentoring and role models. The second key role that these institutions have, of course, is that of conducting research, of advancing knowledge. And in that role, there's really two dimensions that I think we um, might think about hanging meaningful actions out of the summit off of and thinking about innovation and partnerships with higher education and with um, our learned societies. And that is one, the environment in which uh, research is conducted and the gender dimensions of research has already been highlighted. So within those, um, again, there are the issues of access, of climate, of policies that uh, promote uh, more um, unfettered access for all of our citizens and um, climate and policies that promote uh, their continuing uh, and profitable participation. Uh, work-life balance, which was highlighted. Those, of course, those issues uh, come into play at different phases of a career, and um, understanding of career paths and promoting career paths uh, throughout one's lifetime. And then we heard just great things about how more intentionally and purposefully in various dimensions of research that we're trying to address gender dimensions of research. The third uh, key role is that of delivering economic benefit out of research um, and innovation. So how do we bring about innovation and improvements in meeting the very great challenges of our world? And so uh, specifically, that would include things about um, increased participation by women in delivering these benefits, translating research into economic benefit, into social benefit. Um, but also uh, having increased participation by women in terms of just having the fun of um, translating new knowledge into impactful benefits in society. But there's also, in this dimension as well, of delivering economic benefit, um, the gender perspective on products, on particularizing of products uh, for uh, women in particular at uh, different stages of their life. Um, a fourth role, or the fourth role I would postulate here, is that of honoring excellence. Honoring excellence in the doing of research, honoring excellence in outcomes and in participation. Certainly the learned societies in particular uh, focus on traditions of science, on raising them up, on the traditions of advancing knowledge, um, how you frame good questions, seek answers, and di disseminate results. I'll note, I um, had the honor this uh, June of representing the United States at the meeting of the G8 science ministers uh, that was hosted by Great Britain. And um, they, for the first time in a meeting of science ministers, included also representatives from each country from their learned societies. And as part of our meeting, we got to look at Isaac Newton's signature in the uh, signing book of the uh, Royal Society. But it was an interesting um, twist, I think, in these nation-to-nation um, -nation discussions to have both the government representatives who are focused on policies and current problems, and to also have the representatives of the learned societies and that was the phrase we used at that meeting, which is why I'm continuing to use it, um, that really uh, focused on uh, longevity, about the doing of science, the uh, bringing of technical outcomes over the long haul. I'll note, actually, um, our photo from that group has um, the government representatives in the front and um, the learned society's representatives in the back. And there were only women in the front row. There were none uh, in the back row. So perhaps <laughs> that's something we need to work on on these institutions that um, 
you know, represent the uh, length and uh, tradition of our disciplines. And uh, the fifth role um, that uh, I think that both our learned societies and our institutions of higher education have to offer is the provision of high quality and technically informed policy advice on problems of the day. And so certainly um, having the opportunity now uh, to serve in government, um, many issues, it goes without saying, have very, um, acute technical dimensions that the technical, the solution from a policy point of view are not always riding on that those technical dimensions, but however, it's always important that everyone in the policy making uh, forum understand what the implications are of the technical facts. And so we really uh, do appreciate and look to um, the uh, professional practitioners in our institutions of higher education and the learned societies. So, um, Considering these institutions in all our countries and across regions and these roles, um, we are uh, continuing this discussion to um, increase innovation and promote partnerships between and among institutions of higher education, um, the learned societies, but the private sector, both the nonprofit and the for-profit parts of the private sector, and government at all levels. Um, we heard this morning about the importance of thinking about uh, making impact on some of these gender participation issues at the regional level, so at local levels, in Girl Scout troops, one Girl Scout troop at a time, in classrooms, um, in regions, in nations, and in partnerships of nations. And so it's a very great uh, privilege for all of us to get a chance to hear from uh, these four distinguished expert from learned societies, from um, institutions of higher education. And I think we will uh, go in order of uh, the folks listed in your program. Um, we will uh, begin with Rita Colwell, whom I'm sure everyone knows, though I just had the opportunity to meet her last night, a very distinguished scientist in the United States who served for eight years as um, director of the National Science Foundation, served another long term on the National Science Board, and uh, a distinguished professor at several universities and now at the University of Maryland. Thank you, Pat. It's a great pleasure to have an opportunity to speak with you. <clears throat> I have to um, point out that <clears throat> this reminds me of when I um, was invited to a meeting in Mexico City, and it was a huge ballroom filled with people, and uh, there were three of us on the podium. It was Stan Falco from Stanford, myself, and a young fellow, an assistant professor, who didn't realize the microphones were on, and he looked out and he said, Gee, Stanley, look at all the people. <laughs> and the microphones echoed, people, people. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm just thrilled to see so many people, mostly women, and that's really great. I, I'm going to be very different t today in my speech because I'm going to talk to you about a very practical approach to public health that um, reflects my own work on cholera, but it's, I think, offers an example of how you can take science, fundamental science, and what you learn, apply it, and also utilize the benefits of the intellect of women and their practicality in solving problems and in helping communities, and I think it's highly instructive. So the general theme of my talk uh, this, this afternoon, or this noon, is that um, the environment, the climate, and human health are all very much intertwined, and that we need to understand infectious diseases, and particularly the role of women in being able to keep families healthy um, through understanding these inter intersections. And I, I, I focus really on the safety of drinking water. It is so critical. Sanitation and safe drinking water will be responsible, I think, for um, curbing, preventing uh, at least 26 diseases transmitted by water. And shown here 
uh, on the left-hand side, a country like Cambodia and Ethiopia, where less than 20% of the population have access to clean water, 200 out of every 1,000 children die before they reach the age of five. So that, that is a tragedy and a national um, loss that I think we need to address globally. Um, I spent most of my time working in Bangladesh and India, fascinating countries, and I really, really have enjoyed the f almost 40 years now of research in, in those, um, those countries. The important point is that being able to understand in the, um, the Gangetic Delta and the Bay of Bengal and cholera in those countries has provided an insight and an understanding of the need for public health, uh, safe water, and um, sanitation. The um, work that we have done is included, and I'm giving you a very brief overview, understanding the relationship of measuring by satellite um, chlorophyll, sea surface temperature, sea surface height, salinity, as we can do now more recently, and that allows us to build on this information to predict, based on ground truth, um, what happens um, under conditions of the monsoons, droughts, and the relationship, which we discovered some 25 years ago, of the linkage of the bacteria that cause cholera with the microscopic animals found in the oceans, estuaries, rivers, lakes, ponds, and streams. And so being able to understand this relationship has allowed us to develop a fairly simple solution for providing safe water in remote villages where bringing in uh, treated water distributed to households is a dream way in the future. What we discovered was the bacteria, as you can see in the upper left, are actually f the food for copepods, these microscopic critters, which are actually sort of the elephant of the microscopic world. They're about 300 micrometers, and the bacteria are about 2 micrometers. So the bacteria are found in and on those uh, microscopic animals, which in turn provide uh, food for shellfish and crustaceans, which in turn, the higher level of the food chain, us humans, then will ingest if we don't properly cook and uh, treat. Now, uh, certainly sanitation is a serious problem which provides for transmission person to person, but ultimately we need to understand the environment as a, as a source and how we can protect ourselves from various infectious diseases transmitted by water or even um, by other vectors. Um, it, cholera is a disease that uh, can have an onset very sudden, but fortunately, through the work of many researchers, with oral rehydration, simple water with um, table salt, table sugar, bicarbonate of soda can replenish fluid lost, and within a matter of hours, you can have a recovered victim. And so the studies that have been done have been highly critical. Let me explain now, how do, what's the role of women in all this? Well, it turns out if the rational thinking after 30 years of research, that the bacteria are in the environment, they're associated with these plankton, the plankton are the carriers and the particulate matter, if we could remove it in a very simple way, then we could reduce the disease. And as it turns out, in the villages in Bangladesh, where uh, it's a sort of a multi-activity around the ponds where utensils are washed, water is gathered for drinking, and ablation, that is the um, ablution, the um, um, bathing and um, brushing teeth and everything all goes on rather in close quarters. But by teaching the women to filter the water, and this was done with experiments in the laboratory and all of the basic research that we had done, um, we had found that simple sari cloth, folded about four times, gave you a 18 to 20 micrometer filter. And the bacteria, of course, can pass through, but most of them are attached to particulates and to the plankton in the gut and on the surface. And by teaching the women to fold this yard of cloth, about four times, place it over the collage, pour the water in, and then be able to have water that, as you can see on the right-hand side, it's fairly clear. It may not be as good as the tap water, but 
not so bad either. And the result was reducing cholera by 50%. So it's, it's an application of science applied in a very simple way, but empowering the women who do collect the water and ensuring that their families will stay healthy. What's very interesting is when we proposed this study, which was funded by the NIH, um, the reviewer, the first go around, said, ah, women will, uh, men will never drink water that uh, has been passed through a cloth that's worn by a woman, it's unclean, blah, blah, blah. So we did a little pilot study funded by the Thrasher Foundation. And, you know, we discovered that men were filtering their beer to remove the flies using seri cloth. <laughs> so the moral of the story is um, the reviewers don't always know what they're talking about and just <laughs> resubmit. But the other aspect of it, which was equally amusing, was that it wasn't quite sophisticated enough for NIAID, so they lateraled it over to the Nursing Institute. Thank you, Nursing Institute. You funded it. We did the work. So, um, again, the power of women. Now, that, that's, for, that's for the villages where there's no sanitation to speak of, and there's very little safe water, but that's a technique that provides it. Moving up the chain to a little more sophisticated approach, working with the Safe Water Network, founded by the late Paul Newman and his wife, Joanne Woodward, um, the Safe Water Network, works to this day providing a business approach to communities and providing um, these stations that, are, that use um, devices that can be installed, and then a business model, a business plan arranged so that the costing of the safe water in the 20, 30 liter volumes can be provided to the villagers uh, at maybe two or three cents per multi-liter. And the approach provides local ownership, involves women who can then benefit because, first of all, they don't have to go long distances and the girls can be educated because they're not spending their whole day going to the river to collect water for the family. So by installing these kiosks in clusters of about 40, which we've done in Uttar Pradesh, India, and in Ghana, we've been able then to build capacity and also provide sustainability uh, for the community because we put the money in to educate and um, take the business leaders and provide a sustainable business plan that then can have an ongoing uh, provision of safe water to the community without having to put in additional money or just having done the work and then walking away and if it rusts and falls apart then it doesn't work anymore. This is a sustainable approach. And it, we've been able to um, provide standardized systems um, and large volumes and we can locate, as you can see the dots in the lower left, those are the various kiosks in a, in a 100 meter, 200 meter range, which is what provides them the water capability for the community without the girls and the women having to go long distances to collect safe water. And the important part of it is that we've been able to reduce disease very significantly. The uh, schistosomiasis has been reduced by about 80%. Um, and we've also been able to reduce diarrheal diseases. And um, one last point I'd like to make to bring it back to sort of very interesting, sophisticated science, but something I think is needed to be known, is that we've done a study in Calcutta where we have analyzed um, uh, patients, clinical samples coming in, stool samples coming in, to the hospital, 50 patients, 10 controls. Uh, that is, those without symptoms, family members, or community members. And just using culture techniques for about 26 pathogens, we found that when the patients come in, they don't have just cholera. They have about almost 10 pathogens. 50% have giardia, 60% also have rotavirus, and so this mixture of pathogens, I think, is something that we're just beginning to understand that even when we couldn't buy conventional microbiology but use PCR, we could pick up um, three or four pathogens that have been missed by the culture technique. And that um, when we analyzed where you couldn't get any pathogen uh, tested with PCR, you could pick up 
pathogens uh, in those samples as well. And then using a new technique of bioinformatics that we've been able to develop uh, uh, through the work at the University of Maryland and at Johns Hopkins, we now know that we can determine right down to the species level the presence of these mixtures of pathogens and a very distinct difference between the green on the right, which have, as you can see from the left-hand uh, bars, do not have the pathogens, whereas the red bars to the right will have a mix of these pathogens. So I, I think what I'm, the message I'm trying to make is that we are in a position now of bringing science, engineering, technology in an applied, simple way to developing countries, but empowering women and providing economic benefits, being able to utilize the intellect of the half of the population that is very important to communities uh, in this collaboration. So these communities, um, this, these studies have shown that the gut flora of Indians is different from the Western, the population of Calcutta, even in the controls. We found with the bioinformatics that there are a few pathogens there, and we are beginning to hypothesize that is Mother Nature's way of providing us with constant immune stimulus as a protective mechanism. So these studies have been very uh, effective. I'll close by pointing out that we do need to understand climate in many other ways because this is a part of the world. Bangladesh has 250 million people in that relatively small area carved out on the side of India and um, uh, other Asian countries. But the gray shows what will be permanently underwater with the predicted sea level rise, providing at least 100 million climate change refugees for which we need to be prepared. So we need to ensure mechanisms for providing the women and the children a better way of life and health and their right to happiness too. Thank you. sobering and, um, and gratifying that you've had so much success. Um, our next speaker um, is Phyllis Wise. She's the Chancellor of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. She's a scientist and also a distinguished leader of other universities uh, prior to the uh, University of Illinois um, at the University of Washington, I believe actually serving when my son was an undergraduate there, and uh, Dean of the College of Biological Sciences at the University of California. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here, and I want to thank you, Wanda, and your whole committee um, in organizing this absolutely spectacular meeting that allows us to share some stories and challenges and think about a better future. So it's not a secret nor groundbreaking news that uh, there are continuing challenges for women in uh, successfully navigating a career in the sciences. The fact that this is the third summit and the fact that you are planning future summits means that um, as much as we try, there are still challenges now. There are complex overlapping social, cultural, and educational challenges that combine to make it ha that make it such that women have additional challenges and hurdles at every stage and at every age. This is a gender summit, and so certainly we're going to concentrate on the challenges that women face. But many of the issues that women face are also faced by other minorities. And so I think that as we continue down the quest, the path for excellence, what we realize is that whatever we do will benefit not only women, but other minorities. Um, and I think it's important for us to define diversity broadly so that the impact of what we do is broader than just for women. I'm going to focus my comments today specifically on how we can enhance doctoral, postdoctoral, and faculty communities, both in STEM and in other areas, 
um, and I want to talk about ways that we can enhance the number of women and minorities who remain in these professions because they are rewarding, because they are challenging, and because they are stimulating. I won't have time to talk about the challenges that face women who decide to enter the corporate world, um, requiring educations in the sciences. There just isn't time to approach that very challenging area as well. According to the NSF in 2010, there were over 27,800 doctorates awarded nationally in the sciences. About 47% of those went to women, 7.5% went to minorities, and 4.6% went to minority women. In the same year, if you look at engineering, it's not as positive. There were 7,812 doctoral degrees awarded nationally. Only 23% of them went to women, and less than 5% went to minority candidates. And when you drill down even further to a discipline like physics, it gets even bleaker. Of the 1,570 doctorates given out that year, 52 went to minority candidates about 3%. So these numbers certainly tell the story about women and minorities in these areas. I think um, it is uh, good to look at statistics and to look at numbers, but uh, sometimes that can hide some pretty telling personal stories and the kinds of experiences that individuals have as they go through their careers. I want to start out with just a little bit of my own personal story. My parents immigrated here from China to finish their educational experiences, and they considered themselves incredibly fortunate to be able to stay here. They were supposed to go back to China on December the 12th, 1941, and when they bombed Pearl Harbor on the 7th, um, they found a way to go to Canada for a short period of time and come back on a visa that would allow them to stay, and they became incredibly loyal Americans. Um, I er was born here. Um, after the war, I earned my PhD at the University of Michigan and began an academic career in reproductive neuroendocrinology. Members of my lab and I have been studying what estrogen does to the brain, uh, particularly females, um, and how we learn and cope in slightly different ways than men do. Um, I've had the privilege of training more women than men, but I must say that at every stage of my career, there were very few women colleagues around, and there were particularly even fewer minority women around. My parents assumed that I would always assumed that I would pursue a career that required a doctoral degree and beyond. Um, in fact, my father, who was an MD PhD, was always disappointed that I hadn't gotten an MD. Um, and only got a PhD. He felt that if I had gotten an MD, I would be able to get a job no matter where a husband would take me. Um, and so, although he was always a supportive father, he always wished that I had been able to get yet another degree. Um, I recall only two women professors at the University of Michigan in my graduate program. And when I went to the University of Maryland, Baltimore College of Medicine, um, I was the only woman for the vast majority of time that I spent there. Uh, the second woman was recruited when I chaired the search committee. <laughs> when I got to the University of Washington and became the interim president, I was the first Asian American woman to ever lead a public research university. So. still have a ways to go. I think uh, the path has been um, made for us by many women who preceded us, and it is our job to broaden and smoothen that path for the next generation of women. But I stand here today knowing what it is like to be a minority in a department, a minority in a college, and a minority in your field. So I firmly believe that I owe it to my professional success, I owe my professional success largely to the wonderful people, men and women, who mentored me all along the way and who gave me incredible advice before, sometimes before I even knew I needed it. Um, I'm, as I look back though, I think about how fragile my career path was and how very fortunate I was. And uh, the numbers that I cited have a very personal meaning to me. 
because what it says to me is that there are still too many women who will have similar experiences to mine that I had over 40 years ago. And so I have a very vested interest, both personally and now as a professional academic leader, to make sure that there are an increasing number of women who succeed in STEM areas and that we must make it an institutional commitment to make sure that the environment for everyone is better all the time. Um, for doctoral students, we basically have a five-year window to bring them in to the academy, to train them well, and then to send them out into careers where they can be successful. And for today, what I really mean is a STEM career that leads to the professorate. Um, a critical mass of women and minorities is absolutely essential. Because if there isn't a critical mass, what we will be doing every year is fighting with each other, battling for um, the very small group of women and minorities in, uh, that are really qualified to enter into the pool. And it, so what's so important about increasing the number of people who are trained to come into the academy is that there will be a broader pool from which we can all choose when we are searching for women and minorities to fulfill the kinds of positions that we want. Now I know this session is supposed to be around partnerships and I want to take my hat off to the NSF because um, it is one of the federal agencies that really gets it, that has integrated the idea and practice of diversity with a real focus on women as a route to future excellence in their programs, in their panels, in their awards. And actually, the NSF was one of the first, I think, agencies to really concentrate on this and not just sort of let it happen, thinking that it would happen naturally without any particular focus. There have been an abundance of external initiatives to explore the basis of gender and minority get, um, bias and the gap uh, that exists and how to close it. And again, I take my hat off to the NSF. But we're not at a tipping point yet, and um, we haven't gotten that critical mass. We could easily go backwards if we don't continually and unrelentlessly continue to push forward and sustain any of the progress that we've made. We must be sure that we use all funding, particularly from the federal government, but even from our state government and from private philanthropy in the best possible way to change the way we do business all the time and not just hire a single individual who uh, meets the, the need of the moment. The University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign ranks third in the country in terms of um, science and engineering doctorates for men, and we rank 14th in um, the number of women during the same period of time, that is 2006 to 2010. And so if we can increase our capacity and our ability to recruit, we will have, um, along with a network of universities, a real impact on the number of women and the number of minorities in STEM areas. Um, we're absolutely committed, we and colleagues at many different universities are committed to becoming national role models um, in how universities must organize themselves to create graduate, postgraduate, and faculty experiences where a diverse population results from a sustained, strategic, and collectively shared commitment. This means making diversity integral to the whole process and not just the add-on after you've formed a committee thinking, oh, was that really, did it really have um, someone who can represent diversity? It has to be in our financial planning. It has to be in the way colleges and departments interact. It has to be in the way we administrators um, develop the policies. And one more time, I'll take my hat off to the NSF, a federal leader that considers racial and gender diversity as an integral part of excellence. It's not because it's legal, it's not because it's right, it's because it is, by definition, a part of excellence. And I want to give just a couple of examples of things that we've done uh, over the last couple of years. Um, I formed a group called EDGE, 
enhancing diversity and guiding excellence at the University of Illinois. Um, it is a group of four faculty members who have gone around to each of the colleges and each of the search committees and talked about how to integrate diversity into the way we search for the next faculty member, and also in terms of student recruitment, in, in, including how we do our budgeting, including how we do our fundraising. This program is faculty guided. It is not a top-down um, affair. It is how we at Illinois are going to be a preeminent public research university with a land-grant mission and global impact. In terms of faculty hiring, we have committed to hiring 500 new faculty over the next five to seven years. And we're not just going to be looking at great faculty, we're going to be looking at great faculty candidates who are diverse and who are women. We are doing this, some of this in cluster hiring so that we can create a critical mass that can be able to be qualified to apply for research grants that take teams of people. But we're also doing this to be able to create teams that can innovate in the way we teach, in the way the students learn, in fact, the way we all learn. From, for the very first time, all hiring proposals will be approved, uh, will be approved after a dean submits a proposal and puts the context of this single hire into their short-term and their long-term strategic planning, taking diversity into consideration. Um, we are also uh, increasing our investment on what we call TOPS, Targets of Opportunity, and that is to say that we are putting in $85,000, up to $85,000 a year for every recruitment of a person who is a faculty member of color or a woman in STEM areas. If that search turns up a second candidate who is equally qualified, we will also put central funding into that second hire. Um, we are allowing um, search committees to Bring, they usually bring three people to campus. We are allowing them to bring the fourth person on our dime if that person is a person of color or a woman in STEM areas. We, upon the recommendation of the EDGE Committee, we are putting 1.4 million new dollars into um, areas where uh, it will affect minorities and women um, in, so that there are more scholarships, there's more money for startup. Uh, funds. We have hosted a national conference on women faculty in the, in the academy last year. We have a standing gender equity council um, that guides our policy making in everything from salary to child care to promotion and tenure. And we've established an internal networking group to help our women in the academy explore ways for leadership within the university. We are right now gearing up for a substantial capital campaign, what university isn't, either in one or gearing up for one. And many of these will be guided toward endowed chairs and endowed professorships with particular focus on diversity and on women. Um, so we're starting, and we are certainly not satisfied, but we are starting um, to really think of diversity as part of our DNA. And I think this is what is absolutely critical. As my colleague, the dean of the uh, graduate school, who's sitting in the back of the room, um, has said, we at the highest levels of leadership have skin in the game. And what do we mean by skin in the game? What we mean is that we're going to form a way of putting permanent investments to unwavering commitments to a university that is destined to be a place that is going to be a destination place for women and minorities who are qualified to be at a research intensive university. We're reprioritizing the way we use our money from the state, our money from tuition, and our money from philanthropy. We are organizing ourselves to work more efficiently with external partners. We're putting ourselves in a position where external funding from NSF and other sources are used to the best way that they possibly can. And if, God forbid, those investments uh, 
go away, which I'm hoping they never will, but if they do go away or if they diminish, we want to make sure that the programs that we have started under the sponsorship of this kind of investment do not go away and that they continue. An example of our institutional readiness and support um, was uh, in the, our recently uh, awarded AGEP grant that is an alliance for graduate education for, and the professorate that is about a million dollars um, to the university. And this creates um, a consortium, a way for the big 10 universities basically, plus two more, um, to work together and make sure that we increase the um, number of postdocs prepared for faculty positions by developing mentoring networks. And the second part is to, working, is to work with hiring committees to reduce the bias and develop ways that they all look at diversity um, from the very first step. This partnership between networks of public universities and also networks between universities and uh, federal agencies as well as private um, air, uh, private philanthropic foundations will have a definite impact on STEM and we are really eager to continue the work and intensify our focus on this. As a nation we've spent a lot of time and money and effort in expanding the STEM areas um, for women and minorities and while there's been undeniable progress when I look ahead the, the path ahead is long and arduous, and we all have to be in this together. I think it's time to start, stop looking outside and actually look within our institutions to see how we can work ourselves and make sure that we are doing our part, that whenever we have a partner, whether or not it's a federal agency or a private donor, that we use their money efficiently to make sure that more women are represented in these key STEM areas. Thank you very much. That was terrifically inspiring. Thank you for outlining all those um, programs and your passion. Um, our next speaker um, comes uh, from our uh, part of the North American Summit from Mexico. So, um, and we're very pleased to have Rocio Casang who is the intellectual property manager at CIA Tech, T-E-Q, Mexico, I don't know how to say that, I'm sorry, and um, also is a technical advisor for the Faculty of Chemistry and a university coordinator for technology management and a number of other things I'm sure she'll tell us about. Thank you Thank so you. much, Rocio. Thank you. Thank you very much for, every, for my, this invitation. I, I'm really honored and, uh, well, I'm learning humility because uh, I feel really, really small in face of uh, all those magnificent speakers. And, uh, well, uh, I was wondering why, why I'm here. Well, actually, because um, I want to talk to you about my experience, which is long, you can see, and uh, why I think educating for women or for men or for humankind, and the process and the gender focus in the transfer technology process. And, uh, okay, some other uh, communication later. Then, why, why I, I want to tell you something, because I have something to say. Uh, I have seen changes all my life, like a student, like a professor, a teacher, and a professional. And, uh, okay, as a leader in some uh, of uh, my personal projects and uh, my professional life. But I also really believe in equity. I also believe really in justice. And I think equity is the first statement of justice. And I don't believe women have to be over men, but less men over women, of course. But uh, of course, something more is because I always have been working with intellectual property, and this has no gender. The intellectual property is more intellectual than any other activity in our careers. Not like a scientist, not like an engineer, like a mathematician. Intellectual property means something more. It means that you have an idea and you are provided 
to the society. And this is much more than gender. Then, okay, educating for women, for men, or for humankind. Research and, of course, patenting is the visible result of the research applied to the humankind comfort and living. Every, every law in every country patent is granted when the, this is a solution for a technical problem. And the technical problem means that comfort living means health, means some engineering buildings and, and roads and everything. So intellectual property means that we have an idea to solve a problem, and this problem has no gender either. Research's commitment and method is more than a gender focus. It's a commitment with the result, with the path we are making, and oriented to our clear objectives. This is the vote, well, we have to make research devoted to improve li life for human beings, for animals, and to protect the environment, of course. However, commitment is strongly associated with education and atmosphere. Uh, I seen a lot of anecdotes uh, of stories today and yesterday, and I know that atmosphere and family and, uh, uh, ambience means something for uh, the research and the, 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 the girls or boys oriented to research. And uh, if feminine minds uh, works different than masculine minds, and I think this is fantastic, I like men also, a commitment, well, I, I, all my life, and this has been long. Commitment is a real force behind a successful research effort. The commitment, not the gender. More and more, we are looking for groups, mixed groups, with boys and girls, with men and women, with big doctors and big doctors, women, female, that are working together, looking for a good, real solution for a problem. And then, how we can they transfer to the real society, to the problem, to the health community, and uh, to the point of view of the, even the politicians and the, the politics and uh, the people who is taking decisions by the proper intellectual property, which is my hobby, actually. Well, it's my profession, but it's also my hobby. And, and I wish you, all of you to have the same. Well, technology transfer is the end of the intellectual process. It's an intellectual process mainly. It only occurs when an innovative technology protected joins a profitable market. Money, of course, naturally money. Therefore, it is necessary to determine the modus operandi for the transfer. Once it's clear, then the goals to achieve, we have to know exactly where we can uh, sell that technology or not, with information allowing to measure or assume the impact, both in terms of financial benefits and for the social, social impact. Of course, well, when a technology transfer find, is, is uh, uh, concluded, then they have been a profit, a profit. But in terms of, uh, of money, we need money to stay, to, to continue our research. And this something we have face we face every every day but also because technology have to be over, uh, overruled ra quickly quickly improved the technology never never is the end of the road is one of the bricks of the steps and we have to bridge over that in that moment the cycle is closed only when the technology is not acquired but assimilated and that means knowledge not exactly, uh, well, something we can see every day. I have something like that. I push buttons, but I don't know exactly how it works. I never been assimilating the, uh, uh, the, the computer technology, never. I think I will have time later, but uh, not today. <laughs> and no, now, well, I, we have to see when the technology is assimilated and when technology is close to health, or to public envi environment, or, the, or to the protecting the environment, then it's a very, very strong technology, and we have to assimilate it. We have to know how it's working, and this is knowledge. It's not only technology, it's more than that. It's inner, inside the mind of the man, or a woman, or a boy, or a girl, I don't care. That moment, well, when they, 
when the benefit is improving the result of a, a company, an enterprise, then we have a wealthy country, a wealth community, and we have many, many com companies trying to follow this path. That is a successful path, and uh, we have to be sure that our technology is not damaging or our, our minds or our students or our society, our communities. And then, is technology transfer or technology no, or, or knowledge technology uh, transfer? I think it's so close that sometimes we mix them. It is generally accepted that men think different than women. Well, sometimes it's very good that, really. And within the scientific community, this definitely impact on the results. But it's not exactly the result when it's showed. The inter I have to tell you something. I was looking for statistics for patents granted for women or men. I, we don't have, but we don't care. Is this is the result which which is uh, important? I don't care if it's a man or a woman, a boy or a girl, which is uh, making a patent. The important thing is and is improving the kind of life, the improving the uh, environment, improving or protecting something different in our world. And the approach to a scientific problem from the man point of view is organized, is methodical, and most of the time with a little shade of stubbornness. Uh, well, not little, sometimes a lot of stubbornness. And women, otherwise, we are intuitive and creative, and it is important ingredient to the methodology applied to the resolution. The creativity is one of the fantastic difference between women and, wom and, and, women are wom and, and men. And uh, okay, if we apply it to scientific projects, then we have fantastic results also. Both ways are valid, both ways are acceptable, as well as they lead to a, profitab a profitable result, a, f a clear result, an objective, a rigid, an objective uh, already uh, accepted and uh, protected in an intellectual uh, way. Okay. The change from a scientific solution to an utilitarian, I'm sorry, I never studied in the United States, but I think I can reach for that also. I am not uh, old enough. The change from a scientific solution to an utilitarian technology is more complicated when an enterprise is involved in the process. An enterprise has not gender either. And the enterprise is sometimes led by men, but also working with women. And more and more do we have girls, well, men, women, working as leaders in, an comp in a company. And they are very, very strong. Sometimes they are as strong as any other leader in the world. Technology means market, of course. And technology and innovation means market also because the patent, the definition of a patent means that we, you have to apply it to an industrial process. Also production model, and requires raw materials, requires distribution channels, trained people, and many other things. Technology needs as well a complex learning method associated to all, all those mentioned factors. We have to make, to have a, a knowledge supporting the technology, we have to have the channel distribution, we have to learn how to produce, we have to learn all the process involved. Especially technology must be adopted by the society. If you invent something that anybody, anybody wants, you never will sell it. So you have to see what do you want, how do you want it, and when do you want it, and then pay the price. But especially technology must be adopted by society it means a lot of things. It means that I'm looking for the society. I know the needs of the society. I know how to offer the society what I'm, what I'm learning, what I'm producing, what I'm discovering. And it, uh, masculine allows to develop production systems traditionally. Feminine intuition may detect how to reach, how to better marketing all the system. And then there is a complementary skills together in a company, in an enterprise, in a profitable process. Both together may see the success on top of the development, together. And uh, I like it to be together with many other people, with many other minds. And why educating then? Education in early stage reaches the largest number of people under 12 years old. After years of school, children or young people are all alike. Okay, 
with the same orthograph or lack of orthograph, with the same uh, skills, with the same equipment, and with the same, okay, they are almost the same all over, the, well, in the country. In productive stage, notorious difference once the student is looking for him or herself, and we are facing and dealing every day with hiring uh, difference all over the world. Okay, I, I found something very interesting in the in a, a report from the OECD. Uh, when you uh, have uh, people with uh, with tertiary education, PhD and master's degree. Only in Mexico, only 43% is employed, uh, versus 80, no, versus 87% of men employed when they have a PhD or something. I don't know exactly why. I, I, I'm really worried about. I found it when I was presenting, uh, preparing this, and I really worry why girls or, or women with the PhD are not working in Mexico. Okay, well. In the world, the OECD reports that women with third uh, education degree, the tertiary, tertiary education degree, has uh, reached more than 70 percent. Though we are at half of the uh, in Mexico, we are half of the rank. It's uh, terrific. But in pro uh, okay, for research and development, there are few differences from masters or professors. I also think that. Uh, Many of the researchers have very good professors, female or male. That's not a problem. The personal goal achievement of is a single effort result, and communities often are groups of both genders people, mixed groups. Sometimes we have better results when we are mixed people. And once the stage of the sexual attraction is over, because they are always distracted by that. I know that. So, well, they grow up. Don't, don't, okay, don't lose hope. They grow up. And well, and then from the student to the engineer. This is already no, uh, accepted and the patent is mainly is associated with the number of engineers in a country. And I think that's true because the patent needs to be applied to an industrial, industrial process. And engineers sometimes, male or female are the same, are working in that process. And okay. In Mexico, being an engineer is not always related to a formal education. Being an engineer means something like I can see the way for something. And in Mexico, many of our patents are granted for people without formal education. I love that. But I think also that is a very, very, uh, very dangerous step. We have a lot of patents granted for people without a formal education, and I think we have to educate that people because they will make something better, something spectacular, I think. And the creativity and manual skills are replaced many times, uh, are replacing many times the classroom and the formal education, and it's recognized when a patent, a grant patent is, uh, is uh, obtained. And, and in, uh, well, uh, employers are not always looking for formal education in some areas. In some areas, they want to look uh, for a formal education. But if you have a patent or you have an idea or you have skills, you are engaged sometimes. And from the engineer to the patents, now is the natural way to insert scientific knowledge, a scientific progress in the customary social environment is not exactly the knowledge than the the the, inter, the the first step of knowledge which is patented or granted. You have to protect it. You have to be aware whether you are uh, disclosure uh, disclosing uh, your uh, your you're discovering, but you have to protect the results. And you have to protect it even if you give it for free. It's not money inside. It's just to be sure that it's as well organized that you can get a patent. And the patent is already a world, a worldwide value for, a company, for companies. Usually, business companies state an economical value to the granted patents. More and more patents are uh, included in, uh, in, active, in uh, the financial value of companies. This represents more than a legal success. It's more than that. It represents the solution for a technical problem that my company is able to give. That my company or your company is, is able to, to explore and uh, to make, uh, to distribute to all over the world. 
And, uh, well, you, OECDC and Canberra suggest that engineers are often behind the patent application. Therefore, it, we are not able to create engineers it's or in or out of classrooms. The number of, pa of patents for every country will dramatically, dramatically decrease. And I really think that engineer has not a gender. I'm sure for that. In Latin America, and I must finish, uh, in that uh, report I, fo I found, uh, they, figured the, they published the figures for education for versus edu professional activities, and it is evident for everybody who can read it that women represent a very small percentage of the qualified labor force. Because in our system, we don't qualify uh, being a housekeeper or a mother. Sometimes we might look for that. In Mexico, for the, well, that's uh, the figure I told you, the employment rate was 79% for all the people with tertiary educated people, and the average in OEDC is 83% for all gender, the both genders. Employment rates among women are substantially lower than those among men. But okay, this is nothing new. Uh, we have already five hours to start, uh, talking about this. The same document, the OECDC, presents the optimistic figures for Latin America and for Mexico. And okay, we are improving. And that is the hope I want to share with you. Okay, when I was young, and this is a lot of time ago, uh, we were five, six, five engineers in the, in, in the university. Now there are a lot of them, and they are working as hard as any other man. I don't like uh, to think that women are better than men, but are as well as, uh, as any other men. Okay, we want to evolve to a better society, and I, want to, I would like to see it. We can take from mathematics the following sta statement. Women are equal to men, but women are not identical to men. And I love that, really. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. for that perspective on knowledge transfer and for this definition of CIATEQ. Um, our final speaker, and uh, we also need to thank her for uh, setting everyone up on her computer here today, is uh, Professor Allison Sekuler from, uh, Sekuler, uh, from McMaster University in Canada. She is the, where she is the Associate Vice President and Dean. She's also a Professor of Psychology, Neuroscience, and Behavior, and served as the inaugural Canada Research Chair in Cognitive Neuroscience. Thank you, Allison. So I'm going to be echoing a couple of the themes that we've already heard throughout the day. And I'm going to start by talking about what the landscape looked like when I started my own academic career some 20 plus years ago. It looked a little bit like this. And these silos could represent different departments or programs or different colleges or faculties, different universities, could even represent different sectors. So government agencies, universities, industry, and so on. Whichever level you looked at, Silos were a pretty prominent feature. And in the intervening few decades, although the silos haven't completely disappeared, there certainly has been at least an understanding that we need to shift from the silo model to more of an ecosystem model. And it's not really so much about just breaking down the walls of those silos. It's about building meaningful and authentic partnerships among the groups that those silos contained. It's about functioning as a single unit with a common purpose to advance and enhance opportunities in education and research. And as we've grown into an even more globalized world, the notion of that ecosystem and the critical nature of the partnerships within that ecosystem have become even more profound. And as Angel Guerra said, the more globalized and interdependent the world becomes, the more we need great collaborators and orchestrators, not isolated individuals, no matter how well they do. So how do we make it work? How do we take this diverse group of organisms, if you will, 
and get them to function as a unit within a common ecosystem. For this ecosystem in particular, I really believe that there are three key elements that we need to make it function. Awareness, community, and perhaps most importantly, courage. Now, awareness really just means recognition that there's even an issue that needs to be addressed. When I did a Google search for the word scientist, a Google image search, these are the top 10 images that popped up. And I think you can agree, we have a little bit of a PR problem in the way that science is represented. In addition to portraying scientists as pretty much obsessed with bubbling and possibly toxic colored liquids, only one of these top 10 images portrays a woman. And even though we are bombarded with these kinds of images throughout our everyday life, it still doesn't necessarily kick in for people that there might be a bias against women that they face barriers in science that men may not face. And I have to admit, even I was clueless for about the first 25 years of my life. I never even thought of myself as a woman scientist. I just thought of myself as a scientist. And as Julia put it before, I actually might have been classified as an honorary man. Um, and it, it wasn't until I started as a faculty member at the University of Toronto that I finally caught on. And it was because my husband and I taught a course together. We took turns teaching it. One term he taught it, and the next term I taught it. And one time after I was teaching the class, a female student approached me and she said, thank goodness I finally had a woman professor. And I said, I sort of thought about it and I realized when my husband taught the course, 90% of the students that he had were men. When I taught the course, 90% were women. And it turned out it wasn't just a scheduling error. It was intentional. These women were looking for a female professor. They were waiting for a role model. They were waiting to build their own community. And it was around this time that our faculty dean, who was herself a female scholar, formed a women in science committee. And that was about seven or eight of us across all of the, the departments in science at that time. It, we were all of the women in science. But that was enough of a critical mass for us um, to start sharing our stories and to form a community. And that community improved the university for everyone. The university started having a policy, for example, that every major committee had to have at least one woman on it. And we were pretty sure a man set that rule up um, because it clearly meant a lot more work for all of the women. But it certainly also gave us a chance to expand the awareness of the issues and to, to expand our, our, our community itself further. They also created a program to start engaging undergraduates in research from the very beginning stages. And that gave more women a chance to explore different areas of research and develop mentorship relationships really early on, which, as Valerie Jarrett noted, is really key to encouraging more women to continue on in scientific careers. Faculty searches, as were mentioned before, had to invite at least one candidate from an underrepresented group. And that could be either a man in a female-dominated area, it could be a woman in a male-dominated area, or it could be a visible minority in basically any area. And if they didn't comply, they had to explain why. And so guess what? They complied. And as anyone who's been on a search committee knows, once you get your foot in the door, you're all on equal footing. And so our department, in less than a decade, increased from about 10% women to closer to 40% through those sorts of policies. And there are now growing communities of women in science and engineering at universities around the world, including McMaster, where I am now. And we often include key elements of mentorship in those communities, linking faculty, postdocs, graduate students, and even undergraduates, and linking them into the primary and secondary school, secondary school areas, working, as Isabel mentioned earlier, to plant the seeds of an interest in science for young women. And it's important to note that the community includes not just universities, but also includes the granting agencies. And so I was really thrilled when I had my first son at, uh, in 1998, that NSERC had had the foresight not to force new moms to choose between nursing and attending scientific meetings. They actually provided funds for childcare at conferences for nursing moms. They were really ahead of the time, and it made us think more about these things at our own institutions. And even in communities where, where the primary foci play a role in the ecosystem, so for example, within the graduate dean community, we share information uh, throughout my province, throughout our country, and linking in with the Council of Graduate Schools internationally. And those organizations play a really key role in building awareness of critical issues, and, and they, enable, they enable us to share best practices. So for example, we recently redesigned our maternity leave policies at McMaster um, so that we have more flexible paid parental leave policies for graduate students. And we also 
uh, increase the flexibility of our reduced workload policy for faculty members. All of that was inspired by work that had been done elsewhere and that we brought into our own context at our own institution. And I think that anyone who knows work in this field would know Mary Ann Mason's work on creating family-friendly environments. And that obviously inspired all of us to keep focusing on the key issues that affect female scholars and to develop practices to try to solve those issues. And one of the issues that is mentioned at every single graduate dean meeting is the difficulty that our graduate students face in securing traditional positions within academia or even outside of academia. These issues are, of course, compounded for female students and postdocs because they're trying to balance their stage of their education and their career with having a family. So sometimes they end up making the choice to leave academia and to leave research because they don't want to have to try to find that balance. In Canada, we're really fortunate that our granting agencies have some provisions for paid parental leaves during these stages of training, but it's not enough. And I think this is where courage really comes in. <laughs> we need the courage to challenge the traditional mindset of our system. We need to challenge the idea that women cannot have it all. I actually really believe that if we create the right environments, women can have it all. At least they can have it all enough. Deborah Spar lamented on the news hour recently that she, the president of Barnard, a respected scholar, a world traveler, a happily married mother of three, didn't have it all because she had to make choices. Should she go to her kid's concert or should she go to this international conference? I don't mean to pick on her because I think having read her work, I would be friends with her in real life. But <coughs> it struck me that making the kind of choices she was making that's not suggesting that she doesn't have it all. It suggests she does have it all enough. Everybody makes choices. And I'm really more concerned about women who aren't able to have a successful career in academia and research because our systems put up barriers to their success. And I'm more concerned when I hear that an up and coming scholar didn't get interviewed for that job, didn't get tenure, or didn't get that last grant because she made a choice to have a family. And our traditional structures and our policies and expectations just aren't optimized for those sorts of choices. Those are the issues I think that we really need to have the courage to address. And although universities are usually talked about in politics as being bastions of liberalism, uh, in fact, anyone who's been there knows that we're about the most conservative institutions around. We have the departments that we have today because those are departments that we had hundreds of years ago. And change really is a sort of a dirty word at many institutions, and I think that that's changing for sure. Guided by forward-thinking university leaders like Phyllis, an increasing number of universities have realized that the old ways aren't necessarily the best ways. And so we're breaking out of that historical department structure. We're creating great numbers of interdisciplinary programs addressing big issues like water, like sustainability, like neuroscience, like poverty. And when institutions value and enable building partnerships across those traditional disciplines, they automatically enhance opportunities for women and other underrepresented groups. And that's because none of these big problems can be solved within one discipline alone. And so even in fields where women are woefully underrepresented, women will find colleagues and mentors in partnering disciplines. And I think as that critical mass forms, everyone just becomes more aware of the issues that women face and the understanding that different people have different needs and take different paths it's going to become more clear more accepted and even more supported and the granting agencies have a role to play here too of course as partners in this ecosystem they need to ensure that funding is available for researchers working at the intersections of knowledge and the governments and granting agencies can also help change along by supporting research on gender issues uh, and by requiring change. As we've heard throughout the morning, many agencies already have built gender equality and family-friendly initiatives into the policies, but I really think that we need more um, because they need to help to move those policies forward at the universities. So for example, when NSERC first started asking people to explain why they might have a gap in their research because of having kids or being ill, that allowed tenure and promotion committees across the country to start considering those issues as well. When agencies required us to make our, public, our publications accessible, we did it because we were told we had to do it. When NSERC highlighted the role of mentoring in research, 
faculty fell in line. And as odd as it seems, sometimes universities just want to be told what to do. And that's so that the change averse faculty members, when they challenge the policy, we can say, I'm sorry, I don't really have a choice. <laughs> Those sorts of policy requirements actually can have worldwide implications. I recently heard a case about a representative of a country with a quite poor record of supporting women in science and in general, asking a granting agency to require a certain number of women or a certain proportion of women to be included in grants because in his words, that's the only way that his country was going to move forward. In a sense, it's like when my son asks me to make him practice piano, uh, because it's easier for him, instead of saying to his friends when they're playing Minecraft, I'm sorry, I can't play anymore because I really want to work on my sonatina, it's easier for him to say, my mom made me do it. And I think that you can see a really great example of the my mom made me do it phenomenon when you look at the percentage of women on public boards around the world. Um, as you can see here, many of the countries that are represented today really don't have a very good record uh, in terms of having women on boards. In Canada, only about 10% of women um, are on, on public boards, or sorry, the boards have only about 10% women, and an astounding 40% of these boards have zero women. Now consider a country like Norway, where it's mandated that the boards need to have 40%, and guess what? They have 40%. In other countries like Australia, where quotas aren't really favored, instead what they've done is to have a comply or explain rule, kind of like we use at the University of Toronto in hiring. And what they've done there, in addition to having more mentorship for women and mentorship for hiring committees, is to, over the last three years, increase their, their proportion from 8% to 16%. So although percentage-wise it's not a lot, they've doubled it in just three years with a little tiny bit of tweaking. And I really think that we can learn from the approaches that have been taken in the world of business, as was mentioned, I think, earlier. For example, in areas where women are underrepresented in high-profile awards or collaborative group grants, granting agencies could actually take a comply or explain approach. And the more extensive and public the explanations have to be, the more likely we will comply. But it's not only that we can learn from some of the approaches, I think we actually have to start partnering more with them as well, because the businesses and, and, non and the private sector play a really important role in helping solve those big problems, as was mentioned earlier. We should make it possible for women who choose to move into the private sector to remain connected to the universities, to enhance mentoring opportunities for our students, and to enable a greater exchange of resources across the sectors. And I finally just want to touch on the issue of internationalization in partnerships, because we have a very international group here, and I think that that's where we're moving. Research and education no longer knows any boundaries. Technology has made it trivially easy to connect in really meaningful ways around the world. So for example, platforms like Google Plus make it simple to form virtually connected classrooms across the world. And many of our institutions now have multinational academic programs we're engaging in co-tutel supervision of students, and virtually all of our institutions are engaged in um, the international research. I think that all of those sorts of approaches to internationalization and globalization are really good for women, because when we partner with countries that have better track records than we do, um, we learn from them, and vice versa if we're partnering with countries that have worse letters, the, uh, worse, worse um, policies than we do. The more global partnerships we form, the stronger our science will be and the stronger global support will be for women in science. Granting agencies and universities and public sector partners and private sector partners around the world are increasingly working to enable more mobility, but we need to do more. And even simple approaches can help. So one simple approach that I heard from a program we have um, called MyTax in Canada, which among other things brings undergraduate students to Canada from around the world. Their Global Links program initially had almost no women coming from these parts of the world. They said to the students who came, go home and tell your colleagues that Canada welcomes women and that women are safe. And they tripled the number of women participating within one year, just from that simple sort of action. So I think in summary, we need to ensure that we're aware of the barriers to success. We need to create communities in which it's safe to discuss those barriers. And we need to share best practices to address them. 
Most importantly, we really need to accept the fact that we're all part of this larger ecosystem and we all have a part to play. We want to be gate openers and not gatekeepers. And so we need to have the courage to advance and enhance opportunities in education and research to act in ways small and large to ensure that the, the gate is fully open in the next generation for all women and all men. Thank you. Thanks so much, Allison. A great set of uh, ways for us to remember um, how to organize many things to do. Um, this is a terrific panel. Um, why don't we give them all another round of applause? <laughs> And as I think was...